Hello and welcome back to Introduction to the Philosophy of Religion. In this, our final week of the unit, we'll be looking at the afterlife, or rather at particular aspects of the afterlife, as found in three different religions, Islam, Shona and Akan. This segment will focus on Islam, and in particular the often made claim by Christians that the Islamic depiction of paradise is more suited to animals than to spiritual beings like humans. Indeed, Christians have had a long tradition of criticizing the Islamic notion of paradise for its emphasis on carnal pleasures, rather than on the more spiritual kind. And a good example of this is the 18th century figure George Sale. He was one of the first English translators of the Quran. In a, in a long preface to his translation, Sale complained that the vision of paradise in the Quran was puerile, being full of sensual delights, which stood in stark contrast to the more spiritual vision of heaven that he thought Christianity professed. Sale did admit that even the Christian vision of heaven was to a large extent described in terms of sensual delights. For example, the Bible describes a magnificent city of gold and precious stones, through which runs a river, on either side of which there are all sorts of fruits. And the Bible also tells of the blessed eating and drinking in heaven. To this, Sale conceded that it's impossible to convey an idea of spiritual pleasures without using images of corporeal things that were familiar to us. But he stressed that in Christian heaven there will be no marriage, and presumably therefore no sex, because its inhabitants will be like angels. And this, he said, was very different from Islamic paradise. Now certainly the Quran does draw a picture of paradise in which sensual pleasures abound. Hence we're told that inhabitants of paradise will dwell in palaces, dress in fine garments, wear silver bracelets, sit on comfortable couches surrounded by cushions and carpets, and be served delicious food and drink. All around are flowing streams or springs, some of pure water, others of honey, or milk or wine. But perhaps the most intriguing and controversial carnal feature of Islamic paradise is the presence there of huris, paradise companions provided as a reward for believers, or at least for male believers. As you may know, this idea is often thought to be a motivation for modern day jihadists. Back in 2004, a 16-year-old boy strapped with explosives was stopped at an army checkpoint in Israel. During interviews, he revealed that he'd been motivated by the thought of being rewarded with 72 virgins in paradise. The belief that the Islamic faithful would be rewarded in paradise by 72 virgins was even the cornerstone of the first novel written by our current Prime Minister back in 2004. And the novel is actually called 72 virgins. In this segment we'll look at the basis for the idea of paradise companions, virgins or not, and we'll consider whether the Islamic afterlife is more sensual than spiritual. So let's begin with Huris, these paradise companions. First of all it's important to note that the word Huri does not mean Virgin. From the word huri, we can ascertain that the defining feature of these creatures is their eyes. The Arabic etymology tells us that the huri has large or dark eyes like a gazelle, and so is a doe-eyed beauty. Hence the term huri literally means someone with eyes whose whites are extremely white and whose pupils are extremely black. Now there are four explicit references to Huris in the Quran. And from these we can ascertain that the Huris are female, beautiful, pure, kept hidden from the general gaze, 
and rewards for believers, or at least for male believers. The statement that the Huri restrain their glances is typically taken to mean that they look at no one except their own husband. In other words, the believer to whom they will be married. It's also notable that every time the Quran mentions the Huri, it's in the context of other delights of paradise, such as flowing springs, delicious food and drink, fine clothes, comfortable seats and so on. By including the Huri in the catalogues of the delights of paradise, the clear implication is that they are there to be enjoyed. But enjoyed how exactly? Well, clearly their beauty would be a source of enjoyment, but the fact that men will be wed to them may suggest that they're there to be enjoyed sexually as well. And certainly there arose a tradition of viewing huris as sexual rewards, and there was plenty of lurid speculation about this. So some thinkers suggested that sex with a huri lasted for eons, others that a huri had her virginity restored each time she was deflowered. But another line of thought suggested that huris had the most melodious voices imaginable, which could imply that they were prized more for aesthetic reasons than sexual ones. Which brings us to the question of whether huris are virgins. As I've just noted, there was and has been no shortage of people happy to view them as such. But all the Quran says on this is that they were untouched beforehand. This certainly seems to imply that their virginity is intact. Nevertheless, virginity does not appear to be their defining feature. That belongs to their eyes and their dazzling beauty. As you can imagine, the Huris have provoked a lot of discussion among scholars since the Quran was written. In recent years, it has been suggested that the promise of Huris in paradise can be explained, at least in part, by the early audience of the Quran. The Quran is said to have been dictated to the Prophet Muhammad over the course of 22 years, and the composition of the Quran is generally divided into four distinct periods of Muhammad's life. During the third of these periods, the Huris disappear from Revelation, and they're not mentioned again. During that same period, we start to see references to earthly spouses as one's companions in paradise, or rather to spouses that have been made pure. Now the two cannot be the same because Huris are created specifically for paradise. They are pure by nature, and so have no need to be purified, whereas human spouses would. So it looks as though the message changes over the course of the time the Quran was written. In the first decade or so, Huris are presented as the afterlife companions and reward of men. In the second decade, Huris disappear altogether, and instead the message is that we will be accompanied in paradise by our purified spouse, or spouses. In this context, spouse refers both to male and female spouses, suggesting that it will not just be men who have companions in paradise, but women as well. So what would explain the shift in message? According to one scholar, in the early years, the Quran was pitched to an audience of prominent patriarchs in a patriarchal society, and its message had to reflect that. Specifically, the Quran had to entice and persuade these powerful men by offering what was likely to appeal to them. And indeed, it's notable that the early depictions of life in paradise would seem to parallel the sort of life that powerful patriarchs of the time would have enjoyed in this world, or aspired to at any rate. After all, it was not uncommon for powerful men at the time to own slave girls, with whom they could have sex whenever they please. And they would also own singing girls, whose role was to look and sound good. It's unclear whether the owners of singing girls would expect sexual favours from them, but this cannot be ruled out. 
In the later years of the revelation, when Islam had become more established with a large community of families, the Quran offers a more family-orientated vision of paradise in which one is joined not just by one's spouse, but also by one's parents and children. And this might suggest that the early inclusion of the Huris was something of a ruse to win converts among powerful men who could be expected to be swayed by the promise of wide-eyed maidens, whether that be because of their beauty and voices or because of their ready availability for sex. No matter why Huris are mentioned in the Quran, the few mentions of them that are there were sufficient to capture the imagination, and literature on them soon swelled. In fact, one can find much more said about the Huris in the Islamic tradition, or hadiths, which are reports of the sayings and doings of the Prophet Muhammad. These were passed down orally for generations after the Prophet's death, until they were collected together and written down by specialist hadith compilers. In Islam, the hadiths are second in authority only to the Quran. Among the many thousands of hadiths, there are a few dozen relating to the Huris. For instance, we're told that the Huris are made of saffron, musk, amber and camphor, that the marrow of their shins will be visible through their clothes, and that their faces are like mirrors. Other of the Hadiths tell of how many Huris will be given to the inhabitants of paradise, or the male inhabitants. So these are the ones displayed on the screen. The first one says that men will have 72 wives, only two of which will be Huris. The second one says that the very least any man will receive is 72 wives. And the final one says that martyred men will receive 72 Huris. Now all hadiths are graded according to how authentic they are likely to be, as reports of what the Prophet Muhammad actually said and did. And the grading is based on the, the chain of transmission as well as the content. The thinking is that those hadiths passed down through a chain of well-known and reliable people are more likely to be authentic than those whose chain of transmission contains individuals with weak credentials, or, or even if there's gaps that we don't know how the report got passed on. And each hadith is usually graded as authentic, good, or weak. The first two hadiths on the screen have been graded weak. That means the contents might be genuine, but should be considered as no more than conjecture. For that reason, most Muslims simply disregard or discard hadiths graded as weak. As for the third of the hadiths, the one that looks to be the source for would-be jihadists today, this is graded as authentic good. And that's a term that's puzzled commentators for centuries. Does it mean the chain of transmission is authentic and the message is good, or the other way around? Or does it mean that the hadith has multiple chains of transmission, one of which is authentic and the other one only good? Theories abound, but no one is entirely sure, though it's generally agreed that hadiths graded authentic good are acceptable or reliable. So there certainly is a basis in the hadiths for the idea of martyrs being awarded 72 huris in paradise, though it is important to stress that this idea does not support terrorist attacks. Despite this, such an idea is now considered something of an historical embarrassment among many Muslims. As one writer put it, this belief is to mainstream Muslims as the belief that we will one day be issued with a wings and a harp is to mainstream Christians. Of course, one rather big difference is that there are no passages in the Bible that tell of humans in heaven having wings and a harp, whereas there are passages in the Quran that tell of male believers being rewarded in paradise with huris. 
even if the Quran itself doesn't specify how many. Now, no doubt, some people simply wish those passages away or ignore them. Though since the Quran is supposed to be the word of God, accepting some parts and not others is a bit tricky. For this reason, there have been a number of recent efforts to rehabilitate the idea of huris rather than simply sweep them away. So some have claimed that these Huris are simply the rejuvenated wives of male believers. Other people accept that Huris are celestial beings, but they stress that they are the rewards for men and women, rather than just men. Perhaps even more interesting is an attempt to extract a more spiritual understanding of paradise from Huris. And this might seem like a tall order, since on the surface, the idea of huris, whether for men and women or just men, seems about as unspiritual a thought as you can have. But in a recent essay, a prominent Muslim scholar suggested that the joys of paradise are archetypes of the joys we experience in the earthly realm, including food, drink and lovemaking. The joy of sexual union can even be seen as a symbol, an earthly manifestation of spiritual union. And this thought is also to be found in a recent commentary on the Quran. Referring to the passages about the Huris, this commentary states that allusions to sexual union in paradise are intended to be symbolic of spiritual union, that is, union with God. So it's said that what one experiences here below is a mere reflection of paradisal joy. But allusion cannot be made to it except by using the language of earthly sexual union, since it is the most intense form of pristine sensual pleasure known in this world. On this reading, it doesn't look as though there will be real sex with real hurries in paradise. Instead, there will be a spiritual union with God, and the closest we can get to imagining what that would be like is to magnify the pleasure we get from sexual union in this life, treating it as a dim and short-lived reflection of true spiritual union. These ideas are just some of the latest in the long debates within Islam as to how the various sensual pleasures of paradise should be understood as straightforwardly sensual pleasures with real celestial maidens or as something else. And by way of a final point, we should also remember that there have been Islamic philosophers who have claimed that only our souls will exist in paradise. Now if that's correct, and we'll have no bodies, then obviously there won't be any eating, drinking or sexual intercourse. The reason the Quran mentions such things on this line of thinking is because they're easy for people to understand, whereas the true spiritual joys of paradise are beyond all human comprehension. The thinking here is that many people, preoccupied with their senses as they are, will nevertheless be moved by a vision of paradise that fits with what they can understand even if it doesn't accurately capture what paradise will be like. Now we began this segment by looking at criticisms of the Islamic vision of paradise as being preoccupied with the sensual aspects at the expense of the spiritual. We've only had the chance to look at the Huris, which are often picked out as epitomizing the sensuality of Islamic paradise, in fact of making it a sexual paradise rather than just a spiritual one. But hopefully what we've seen is enough to cast some doubt on the fairness of the criticism often levelled against Islam on this matter. <laughs>